This is the presentation of computing parameterized invariants of parameterized petronets. This is joint work with Javier Esparza and Mikhail Raskin. So let me introduce the, the parameterized systems we will be using as a running example, and this is the Dining Philosophers. So the Dining Philosophers is a parameterized system that models a group of philosophers sitting at a round table where every philosopher owns a fork that is lying in front of the philosopher. And the philosophers uh, run, all run the same simple protocol. This is they move from think, they may, might move from thinking to waiting uh, with, while taking the fork in front of them. This is modeled by this transition in the Petronet, moving from thinking to waiting, moving the fork from free to busy, modeling uh, that the fork uh, gets taken. This is possible for all philosophers. So Socrates has this transition as well as Friedrich. Friedrich has this transition as well here. And in the second step, the philosopher take, uh, moves from waiting to eating, taking the fork of the neighbor. So in this case, uh, Socrates moves from waiting to eating, taking Friedrich's fork from free to busy. Finally, once Socrates has finished eating, he, um, he returns to the state's thinking in a, a while returning both forks, his own and Friedrich's. This is this transition. And the parameterized um, aspect of this uh, system is the size or the size of the table or the amount of philosophers that dine uh, simultaneously. So this is, uh, we present here six philosophers and the transitions between these six philosophers and the patronet. But as the dots indicate, this can be scaled up arbitrarily uh, large, so there might be more philosophers dining in this round table, or uh, and we don't see them yet. Okay, the agenda for this presentation is that I want to introduce parameterized Petronet as a specification of per for parameterized systems. Then we present uh, how we can identify topological restrictions of parameterized uh, uh, Petronet, and these uh, topological restrictions will allow us to generalize. Um, uh, structural invariance of instances of the parameterized system to structural invariance of the parameterized system in, in general. Also, uh, this becomes then inductive invariance of the general system. And we will be talking a bit about the experimental evidence we have to support that uh, there are actually only very few inductive invariants necessary to prove uh, interesting pro properties of parameterized systems. Okay, so. Uh, let's talk about parameterized petronets as the specification means of um, our parameterized systems. The parameter, parameter we introduce is always the size of the petronet. So for the dining philosophers, every philosopher has uh, every index in the system. So every philosopher has three states and the fork has two states. So we um, use as uh, an underlying mechanism of the definition of the places in the parameterized petronet a finite set of places that is uh, as soon as the size is fixed, replicated for every index uh, smaller than the size. In the case of the dining philosophers, these are the five states we had in our example. So, so the thinking, waiting, and eating state for the philosopher, and the free and busy state for the forks. Uh, the transitions of the instance also has to be fixed in some way. And here is where we use a rather complex um, specification mechanism, that is, we use the full expressive power of the logic weak S1S. Uh, for those of you who don't know what weak S1S is, it conceptually think about it as um, the natural numbers, successor function, and monadic second order quantification. And um, transition formulae, as in this case, uh, has three uh, has three conceptual parameters, but actually the this x and y variables uh, are actually tuples of variables, not single variables, but tuples, uh, one copy for each of the elements of the play set. So for the philosophers, we have, have n, xt, xw, xe, xf, xb, and yt, yw, ye, yf, yb. And the idea is that we can now specify um, uh, the transitions of the system via this transition formula. And uh, an interpretation of these second order x variables and y variables associates with the variables a finite set of um, a finite set of uh, index indices. In this case, all indices will be smaller than m. 
n is the size of the system here. As an example here, the dining philosophers, we have the first transition we talked about where the, where the philosopher moves from thinking to waiting, taking its own fork, so free to busy. And x, the x variables represent the preset of a transition, the y variables represent the post set of a transition. And the combination of the index of the variable plus which elements, uh, which indices are part of the set uh, corresponds to the set of places we will talk about. So in this, for this example, let's say we have a model of this clause of our formula. This is the transition we talked about before, where the philosopher moves from thinking to waiting, taking its own fork. This is because the preset contains the y copy, uh, the i copy of t and f, and this because x t and x f is i, and the w and b copy of uh, i uh, is in the post set because the y variable of w and the y variable of b is, also, is modeled as the i. So basically, the preset is uh, the i variable, uh, the i, uh, the t place and the f place in the i i's index for the i's index and the post set is the w and the b place for the i's index. This is how to read these transitions formulae. And then we get the full uh, instance of size n by taking n copies of our places and then the model class of this transition formula restricted to all of those interpretations which uh, set the variable n to the value n. So if we have the instance where n is 6, the model class is restricted to those interpretations which set, set the variable n here to the value 6. And this is how we obtain the um, how we obtain the instances of our parameterized system. However, since uh, weak S1S is actually a very expressive logic, um, this, is, this becomes unfeasibly to analyze very quickly. And uh, to, express, uh, to give an impression of this, uh, we could also model in this, uh, with our, in our parameterized systems, this uh, special case here, where we say if there's only one philosopher present, this philosopher doesn't take care about table manners, so that we add only in the case if there's one um, philosopher the transition where uh, the philosopher may move from thinking to eating immediately just because no, no one else is there, so the philosopher doesn't have to really take care of table manners, so it suffices to just eat right away without taking any fork, but maybe just use the hands. And um, this is just to illustrate that weak S1S um, might encode certain kinds of special cases or uh, the instances of parameterized systems uh, are uh, not very regular in, some, in the sense that we can um, have structure to reason about in the instances of parameterized systems. This is uh, important because we will be now restricting what um, transition formula we actually look at. However, this uh, is already interesting in the sense that we can have a very expressive, um, uh, very expressive uh, specification language here with this weak S1S formulae. However, now we want to restrict ourselves again, and the, uh, this is done topologically. And uh, so our parameter systems have certain topologies, and the one I'll be presenting, very uh, central here, is our symmetric rings. And the idea for symmetric rings is basically that all the transitions we have, um, that uh, we have this, this blueprint of a transition between two indices, then this blueprint has to uh, appear for all adjacent indices throughout the whole system and every instance. So uh, basically two main uh, properties are important. If we have an, a transition, it has at most two adjacent indices in, its, uh, in the copies that, that we're talking about. Let's see our blueprint here for our dining philosophers. This is at the top. And the two, and all of these uh, transitions are between these uh, two indices. So the, even the transitions that are um, singular for the indices can be thought of as, okay, between these two, in, um, between these two uh, index, indices, this is happening, but they, they are solitary actually. But the idea is now that uh, the, all these transitions only um, talk about two indices, Socrates and Friedrich. And this is uh, the first um, property that only adjacent indices interact. And the second property is this, uh, thought, uh, this uh, thought of 
having a blueprint that is applied to all adjacent indices. So if there's any transition between Socrates and Friedrich, no matter which two adjacent indices I look at, this transition has to be there as well. Um, this allows us to model, actually, uh, give for symmetric rings uh, an equivalent specification in the set that there's uh, this set of four tuples which model the pre and post set via this PL and, P, uh, and Q, uh, PL, PR, QL, QR, where PL and PR is the um, preset of the left and right interacting process index, and QL, QR is the left and right, uh, po the post set states of the left and right in the interacting pro uh, indices. So uh, for every index, we take, we have the transition that PL uh, is, um, instantiated with index i, PR is instantiated with index i plus one modulo n, so this is a symmetric ring, it's a wraparound at the index n, and the post set is then the QL times the index i and the QR times the index i plus one modulo n again. The thing is, if we are presented with an arbitrary transition formula, it's hard to, or it's first unclear if this uh, transition formula actually models symmetric rings, but indeed, it is, uh, can be expressed in weak S1S that a given transition formula only yields symmetric rings. Thus, we can uh, decide the property having a symmetric ring or the presented parameterized system is a symmetric ring. So, thus, this becomes a uh, decidable problem so the, given the transition formula uh, asking the question, is this a symmetric ring? And why is this interesting? So, symmetric rings have nice properties structurally um, so we want to argue, or we want to reason about structural invariants of these parameterized systems, and um, I'll be talking about traps. Traps um, are a structural property of, of petri nets, uh, in the sense that they are a set of places such that every transition that removes a token from a, from these set of places uh, returns at least one token back to these set of places, which renders um, all reachable markings from a marking that um, puts a token into the trap, uh, put at least, puts at least one token in the trap, or always um, putting a token in the uh, token in the trap as well. So once the trap is marked, it can never be unmarked. Thus the name, once fallen in, we're staying there. And um, so in our parameterized systems, since we're talking about, uh, conceptually uh, we are reasoning about them as having the indices zero to n minus one, you can think about traps in instances as words of the same length. This is illustrated here. So we have our six philosophers from the beginning. And the trap that I is marked green just contains the E of Socrates and the WEF of Friedrich. So the word is Emmanuel doesn't uh, has any tr places in this. So this is an empty set. Empty set, the set of E because Socrates contains, uh, uh, provides the place E. Friedrich provides the place WEF. Hannah and Carl don't provide any place, so empty set and empty set again. So the idea is now if we have an empty set, uh, so this is an instance, we observe this trap, we write it as, as, as a word, and we observe an empty set. For example, Hannah. Hannah uh, has an empty set. If I add now, uh, if I consider now a larger parameterized, a uh, larger instance of this parameterized system, so we add a philosopher, maybe here at the place where Hannah uh, since maybe in between Friedrich and Hannah, we add a new um, philosopher. This doesn't change the property, uh, the, the fact that these states between Socrates and Friedrich actually form a trap. And the, th the idea behind this is, if we add a new uh, philosopher for which we don't mark any place, the behavior we add with respect to the trap, so the behavior between Friedrich and this new philosopher, is actually a behavior we already observed between Friedrich and Hannah before. So adding a new new philosopher into here doesn't add new behavior with respect to the transition that we have in the system. This is why we can actually say, okay, this trap is uh, resilient against adding new philosophers to the table because the behavior that we add uh, is already observed in this one situation. And um, this is also possible for more elaborate uh, traps Let's say we have a word again that represents a trap, and we have two uh, two subwords that are equal occurring there. Then we can actually uh, remove one of these subwords, one of these sets, 
still having a trap, or we can add more Zs. Uh, and always adding a new, new Z gives us a trap in the, in the instance of the corresponding size of that observation. The idea here, let's, let's take this as an example. Let's say uh, we instantiate our Z as this EBWF word here and here. The idea is that um, the interaction between the end of W and Z, the interaction between the end of Z and the beginning of Z, and the interaction between Z and the beginning of end of Z and the beginning of U is already observed. And they hold true regard with, with respect to the trap. So adding new repetitions of that, or actually taking a Z out, just uh, in this uh, reduced or uh, mm, uh, pumped up traps, we don't add new behavior with respect to the transitions because only adjacent, uh, as you remember, symmetric rings, only adjacent indices interact. And for all adjacent indices, the interactions are already accounted for if we add new sets or remove sets. This is the important observation that all the behavior we uh, could uh, that could occur already occurred, so we are safe in uh, adding more of these uh, sets as, uh, into the system because we don't add new behavior. We already have observed every behavior that was possible regarding this. This is the quintessential idea of these rules and gives us uh, the, this tool of reasoning from uh, taking instances of traps from finite systems, uh, from finite instances and generalizing them to the parameterized system because in, it's, it's basically a, a similar uh, um, thought as cutoff examples for the whole system, but this is a cutoff of these structural invariants because we don't add new behavior with adding new, uh, the, or with enlarging the trap in certain ways. And um, we implemented a prototype for this and ran some experiments. So we identify four topologies, the ring, the headed ring, the array, and the crowd, and uh, give for all of these examples the corresponding generalization rules and implemented them. And uh, this gives us uh, the, or the observation we want to focus on. So in this table, I only give the, um, the traps that generalize to the parameterized case upwards. And as we can see, for all of these examples, so the, the, the numbers here are very small. So it's always um, rather, uh, although the concepts that you have to observe to prove a parameterized system correct with respect to certain properties like deadlock or mutual exclusion, or uh, in these cache coherence protocols here, it's certain consistency restrictions. But the, um, but the invariants that are necessary to, in, in, uh, to establish these properties are very few. As you can see, there for uh, the cache coherence specifications, deadlock can be proven immediately without even adding any new invariants. This is just uh, uh, falls out of the uh, specification immediately. But for these consistency restrictions, we have simply the one uh, interesting trap that we use, and. Uh, for our in for the example of the philosophers here we have introduced a left-handed philosopher uh, we only have four invariants and you might now wonder what one bb sets are um, so we already talked about traps as structural invariants siphons are like inverse traps it's a similar structural invariant and one bb sets are uh, other structural invariants which ensure that there's exactly one token in a, in a set at, at, at every moment in time. So it's a bit more elaborate, but also more expressive. And thus, they are, this, they are very uh, interesting or very uh, easy, or they are strong to establish uh, properties. And since there are only so few of these invariants needed to establish these properties, we believe that um, it's a very nice tool to use this because this property can be uh, checked by a human afterwards. So you can look at these properties, uh, these invariants, and you can uh, you get something out of this from the analysis with your understanding of the system itself. So this is what I wanted to present to you. We get uh, readable invariants for parameterized systems by uh, generalizing concepts from finite instances. And if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them.